Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Strength and Hormones podcast. Today is another lowdown episode. We are going to be taking a deep dive into the role of the glutathione and the thyroid and autoimmunity. I absolutely love glutathione, and if you're not familiar with it, we're going to talk all about what it is, how it's made, how we support it, and the amazing relationship that it plays with both the thyroid and autoimmune diseases. This is especially an important conversation for anyone that might have both that has thyroid autoimmunity, such as Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. And I'm just so excited to unpack this because it's one of my absolute favorite compounds. It is technically known as a supplement, but it's not really a supplement. I mean, you can supplement it, but it's actually something that our body endogenously makes. And so it's probably one of my favorite compounds that is made by the body that is not necessarily considered a nutrient, but that I would kind of consider it one um, because it is an antioxidant. So let's get into it. Glutathione is, like I said, an antioxidant. It's actually one of the most abundant ones that our body makes, and we primarily make it in our liver. And it has a really important role in maintaining what we call exogenous antioxidants. So maintaining the levels of other antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E in their reduced active states. And so essentially helping us maintain the levels of those antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E that we all know are so important for our immune system, for cardiovascular health, for so many other functions. We actually have an entire episode on vitamin E because we talk about its role in the skin, PMS, and so many things as it relates to women's health and really you could go on and on about the role of vitamin E. But glutathione is naturally made in the body, like I said, in the liver. Um, it's synthesized from amino acids, which are cysteine, glutamic acid, and glycine. And these are things that we can naturally consume through eating foods that are rich in protein um, that have a higher amount of these amino acids. It's one of the reasons why I'm such a huge fan of bone broth and even made our um, protein powder, Functional Field Pro, because it is much richer in glycine than is a typical protein powder. And so it's actually providing you with some of the compounds, the structural building blocks essentially to make glutathione on your own. It also functions as a detoxification agent. And so because it's primarily in the liver, the liver is our primary site of detoxification. And so here it's responsible for helping us detoxify carcinogens, which we get exposed to in the environment all the time through things like pollution, when we grill meats and such. Um, and we it also helps us um, detoxify harmful foreign compounds like heavy metals, mold, you name it, anything that we don't want to be in the body that's going to wreak havoc. Glutathione has a role. Um, it even traditionally medically is used to help with acetaminophen overdose. Um, and so you can see, you know, with acetaminophen, it's metabolized with liver. Um, so you can see the, really the protective role that glutathione has on the liver and how important it is. Some signs that you might need more glutathione, we're going to talk about some of the conditional things like the autoimmunity relationship I talked about earlier, um, but just some like everyday symptoms could be just knowing that you have a high exposure to heavy metals, maybe even knowing that you have lab tests that show you have heavy metal toxicity or high levels of things like mercury, cadmium, lead, so on and so forth. Um, exposure to endocrine disruptors, smoking or alcohol consumption, excessive exercise produces more of these free radicals, which requires more glutathione. Exercise in general is great for helping us make glutathione, but excessive exercise, um, so which is what's common, like athletes, would be something that might need might increase your need for it. Um, radiation treatments, cancer, things of that sort. Um, and then I mentioned acetaminophen toxicity, which um, is something that's used more in the medical, um, like hospital type setting. So I really love using glutathione clinically for individuals that we know have mold, that have heavy metal toxicity, that have um, low vitamin C, vitamin E levels, that we know have autoimmunity. Um, and then I like to use it all the time, but I use it situationally, situationally myself. If I do consume like a glass of wine, I'll have it beforehand. There is some research that shows that you don't want to take it after alcohol consumption. It actually can be harmful. So you do want to take it before. So I like using it in that situation. I also like using it um, before something like sauna, because with sauna, there is free radical formation that does occur. It's one of the ways that um, it's beneficial for us, um, but it, there is that free radical formation that happens. And so it can be helpful to take before you do uh, like an infrared sauna type session. 
And depletion of glutathione is linked to a number of different disease states. This is easily accessible information you can find. Um, we know athletic overtraining. So like I mentioned, athletes, people engaging in multiple hours of exercise per week. What's the threshold for what's considered overtraining? Hard to say, but I always use labs to be able to identify that because there's certain things we can pick up in labs that can tell us, yeah, you're probably um, creating a lot of oxidative stress. One of the ones that I look at quite a bit is called oxidized LDL, um, and that can give us some insight into this. Uh, major injuries and trauma can be one, so like an accident, something of that sort. Uh, people that have wasting diseases like HIV and AIDS lung cancer, or even just undergoing cancer treatment in general, as we know that treatment of like radiation, for example, um, increases the need for glutathione. But chemotherapy, you also get exposed to quite a bit of other compounds other than um, what's active to help kill cancer cells. And so glutathione can be really helpful for that population as well. Um, we also know that it can be beneficial for autoimmune related gut issues like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, alcoholism and fatty liver disease, as well as diabetes or individuals that have like prediabetes insulin resistance. These are all in all populations where we've seen glutathione depletion. So that essentially means that your levels of glutathione are lower and the need for it is increased. And so we want to make sure that we are uh, increasing the food sources and potentially looking at supplementation, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, that's going to help us to be able to support our glutathione levels. So I mentioned earlier, which I really want to get into today, because this is really the topic that's so fascinating to me, is the link with autoimmunity. There have been studies that have shown a significant reduction in glutathione levels in those that have Hashimoto's disease, which is um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and individuals that have autoimmune diseases. There's some other research you can find on things like lupus, for example. And why is this? Well, it all goes back to the mitochondria. We are actually gonna take a deeper dive into the mitochondria in a couple of weeks, but if you wanna get started on learning more about the mitochondria's role in women's health conditions and autoimmunity and why we address mitochondrial function so much in our work with patients and in our program, Inflammation Harmony, um, we have a blog post I'm gonna link below that would be a great starting place to be able to dive into this. And so glutathione is especially abundant in these mitochondria. Probably heard before, mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cell. Um, they're responsible for energy generation and how we convert food into energy. Your mitochondria is also where hormone production initiates. initiates. It's where cholesterol actually gets converted over to pregnenolone, which then helps us make sex hormones. And so our mitochondria cannot function without glutathione. Um, and so in our mitochondria, there's actually a lot of what's called oxidative stress that occurs. Think of oxidative stress as like rust. There's a lot of energy production that happens there. And anytime there's a lot of energy production that's being required, there's a lot of oxidative stress. It's just like if you were to use something a lot, right? It's going to create more rust or it's going to create more uh, like breakdown on that, say, um, like a, a tool, right? Um, that's because of the oxidative stress. And this is why with athletic training or athletic overtraining, we see glutathione depletion happen because with exercise, we are requiring more mitochondria and we are making our mitochondria work harder and harder and there is more oxidative stress that is produced. Um, however, until 2021, it was really unknown as to how does glutathione actually get into our mitochondria. We kind of had this assumption that how it can't really get in there on its own. So there must be something that's transporting it. And they actually found through research, and this was just a couple years ago, that there's actually a transporter protein and it has a big name, but it's called SLC25A39, um, just to be specific here. And it's actually the thing that's responsible for getting the glutathione that our mitochondria need actually into the mitochondria. And it's responsible for also regulating the amount of mitochondria because of that. And so when and our body is low in antioxidants. When we have more things that we're doing that are we're creating oxidative stress, that are causing glutathione depletion, the level of this transporter protein, this SLC, increases. And when our body is like, oh, hey, I have enough antioxidants, we've got enough through dietary sources, there's not a ton of oxidative stress happening right now, this transporter SLC goes down. 
So our body has actually a mechanism of how to regulate how much of that glutathione is coming into our mitochondria, into our cell, based off of how much oxidative stress we're exposed to. All of those things I mentioned, the heavy metals, the excessive exercise, all of these things, right? And so you've probably heard of iron before. And iron is this really important mineral. It's one of the most abundant metals that we have on earth. And it's one of the most abundant metals and minerals that's in our cells. It's so important for thyroid hormone production, so important for energy generation. It's one of the reasons why a lot of endurance athletes deal with iron deficiency, because again, there's a lot of um, mitochondrial usage that's happening during exercise. And, um, but iron is also highly oxidative, which means that when there's a lot of iron, it creates a lot of rust. Um, it creates a lot of oxidative stress. And it's one of the reasons why we always want to be monitoring our iron levels because it's like Goldilocks, just like with anything in the body, we want just enough to where it's supporting energy production, supporting our thyroid hormones, but not too much to where it's creating oxidative stress or inflammation. Um, because when that happens, then we can get into problematic territory with other inflammatory type symptoms and conditions. Um, but because it's highly oxidative, um, without glutathione there, it actually creates oxidative cells, um, oxidative stress in our cells. And so we want to make sure that we're always thinking about, okay, if we're supplementing with iron or if we have high iron levels, we've gotten blood work done, we've seen that there's high levels of iron, we want to make sure that we maybe are supplementing or that we're really mindful of glutathione intake and glutathione levels. Um, because if you're able to maintain the ideal ratio of glutathione to iron, um, then you won't have these issues with oxidative oxidative stress happening in the cell. So the glutathione to iron ratio is incredibly important and glutathione, think of it as like, it kind of keeps iron in line and helps make it so that it doesn't create um, a harmful effect on our body. And so the main function of glutathione is really to protect our cells from what are called hyperperoxidides. They're basically like these little inflammatory things that occur. And so when it comes to the thyroid, why glutathione is so important is because when we make thyroid hormones, there's actually a natural amount of um, hydroperoxides and oxidative stress that occurs in order for us to make T4, which is the inactive thyroid hormone, and make T3, the active thyroid hormone, there has to be oxidative stress. And that's because of our friend iodine. Iodine is a mineral. It's a really important mineral. We need it to make thyroid hormones. But in the process of iodine making thyroid hormones, oxidative stress occurs. So you literally cannot make thyroid hormones without oxidative stress. And all of this um, process happens through an enzyme that's called thyroid peroxidase. If you have Hashimoto's, you've probably heard of this before because you probably have high anti-TPO antibodies, which means that you have antibodies that are attacking this thyroid peroxidase. And this thyroid peroxidase is what um, actually helps to be able to um, generate the amount of these thyroid hormones. And so these, like I mentioned, this oxidative stress is essential to the initial steps of us making thyroid um, hormones, but our thyroid is also particularly sensitive to oxidative damage. Our thyroid is a really sensitive gland. It's very sensitive to a lot of things. It's very sensitive to heavy metals, mold. That's why when we are ever dealing with thyroid issues, we always have to look deeper into what's going on with the liver. We know the liver is where peripherally, so um, essentially in another place of the body, where about 70% of our thyroid hormone conversion is happening. Um, so the thyroid is extremely sensitive to these different like toxins in the body, and it's really sensitive to oxidative damage. Um, but there's also a lot of oxidative damage that occurs here, right? So it's like, okay, how can we win? If we need oxidative damage to make thyroid hormones, but we're particularly sensitive to oxidative damage, then how do we come out ahead? And the answer lies in adequate levels of antioxidants, things like superoxide dismutase, as well as glutathione. And so I mentioned earlier that there's research that shows that glutathione deficiency has been implicated with Hashimoto's and other autoimmune diseases. Um, one of the ways through that is because we know that oxidative stress, which is one of the things that glutathione works on, causes and is caused by autoimmunity. A lot of the symptoms that come about by autoimmunity, a lot of the inflammatory symptoms are actually driven through the oxidative stress. And so if you have an autoimmune disease, you've probably seen that 
your C-reactive protein, your CRP is generally higher. Um, you deal with a lot more inflammatory symptoms, joint pain, headaches, fatigue, brain fog. The whole reason we created our inflammation hormone program because those are one of the side effects of autoimmunity at play. And so glutathione comes in, it helps reduce this oxidative stress. And it does this by actually reducing the body's immunological response. So it basically kind of slows down our immune system's attack of the thyroid or attack of whatever organ and system of the body that the autoimmune disease is targeting. And these autoimmune diseases actually attack your mitochondria. Um, they're kind of targeted towards your mitochondria specifically. And so the glutathione actually works to help protect your mitochondria by destroying those the oxidative stress that occurs. So it's going to essentially kind of think of it as like a neutralizing effect that it has on, um, on the oxidative stress that happens from the autoimmunity. And one of the most effective ways to reduce the inflammation that comes about through autoimmunity is to support our body's ability to recycle glutathione, to support our body's ability to make more glutathione, to make sure that our body always has more antioxidants than it does have oxidative stress. We always want to make sure we're in a net positive of antioxidants. And so we can do this by ensuring that we have the right foods and that we're potentially also looking at supplemental things that are also going to help with glutathione production. Um, and this ultimately is going to help balance the immune system, help protect your thyroid tissue from inflammation and from autoimmune attack, and also help with, again, that generation of those thyroid hormones um, that get destroyed very easily through this oxidative stress. So in um, Hashimoto's in particular, there's actually a mutation that happens in a gene um, that encodes what's called NOx activity. And it's this gene mutation that we've been able, they've determined that's actually what um, causes the excessive stimulation of the oxidative stress. And so, again, this is something that we're kind of up against, right, that we don't necessarily have control over. It's something that's been mutated within our genetic coding. And this is why genes are so important, because if we can understand how genes have been triggered, then we know how the body needs additional support. And it's this accumulation of these free radicals and this excess oxidative stress that actually inhibits that TPO activity. So that oxidative stress is actually what drives those um, antibodies to attack um, that TPO. And remember that that TPO is what helps us in that making of the T4 and that T3. And so when this TPO gets inhibited because of the oxidative stress, then we have less thyroid hormones that are being made. And this in turn leads to um, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. On the other side of the spectrum with hyperthyroidism, autoimmunity, or Graves disease, um, it's actually a little bit of a different situation where we don't necessarily see this mutation in that gene NOx. Um, but what we see is that because there are so many thyroid hormones that are being made, there's this overproduction of thyroid hormones, that it's that overproduction of making like too many thyroid hormones that actually causes the oxidative stress. And remember I said that in order to make thyroid hormones, you have to have oxidative stress. It's just how what happens when that iodine um, combines to make thyroid hormones. And so when you make a lot of thyroid hormones, you can imagine that there's a lot more oxidative stress that happens. Um, and that when essentially um, in this type of situation, there's you know too much um, oxidative stress and not enough antioxidants again. With thyroid nodules, um, which a good percentage of the population have, especially in the U.S., um, we have also seen that the size of thyroid nodules can be decreased with any antioxidant supplementation, glutathione being one of those, others being things like maybe vitamin C, vitamin E, and other type of like plants that have powerful antioxidant capabilities. Um, but this is another reason why glutathione might be helpful for individuals that have thyroid nodules that are trying to shrink them naturally. So what's the deal with iodine? I mentioned that we need iodine. It's an essential mineral for making adequate thyroid hormones, but that with iodine, as it makes thyroid hormones, that this is how we make, how oxidative stress essentially is formed. There again lies a uh, Goldilocks situation here where we want just enough iodine and not too much. Both deficiency and excess of iodine have been shown to cause hypothyroidism. So we need just enough and not too much here. When there's too much, then that's what can potentially drive autoimmune thyroid diseases. That's what we've seen in the research. 
And this is because of the excessive amounts of the oxidative stress that happens through that iodine um, situation within the thyroid. And um, they've actually shown that anti-TPO antibodies, which are what are commonly elevated in Hashimoto's disease, have a dependence on glutathione levels. And there's an, actually an inverse relationship with Hashimoto's. People that have lower glutathione levels have a higher prevalence of Hashimoto's. People with higher glutathione levels have a lower prevalence of Hashimoto's. And it all goes back to how glutathione is helping regulate, essentially keeping iodine in its place so that iodine does what it needs to do in making thyroid hormones and it doesn't get out of hand to where it's causing oxidative stress. Okay, so I hope with all that information, you've been able to see the really critical role of these antioxidant systems in the thyroid and autoimmunity. And I really honed in on Hashimoto's and Graves because those of you that are listening, um, we have a high percentage that have thyroid disease. It's one of our specialties at our practice, um, but really the situation applies in all autoimmunity. Um, maybe not so much about the iodine conversation, but as it relates to oxidative stress. So if you have any autoimmune disease, we want to be thinking about how can we create a, a significant antioxidant pool and lower things that are creating oxidative stress in the body. So there's foods that we can do, we can eat to increase glutathione naturally. Remember, glutathione is made naturally in the liver. So how do we get the liver to make more of it? Well, first, we want to reduce the things that are going to deplete our glutathione, which we mentioned earlier. Secondly, we want to add in things that help us make more. Sulfur-rich foods are incredibly important for this. I talk about sulfur all the time. I'm a huge sulfur advocate because of the role that sulfur has in glutathione production. Sulfur is what is found, you get it in really all animal proteins, but especially things like beef liver and eggs, but the plant sources of sulfur are come from your allium vegetable family, which are things like onions and garlic. So the more of those in the diet, the better. Um, cysteine and glycine rich foods, remember also what um, help us make glutathione. So those are really important. Again, it's one of the reasons why I love bone broth, um, meats that have bone in, because those also have higher glycine content. Or you can always lean on our protein powder, Functional Field Pro, because it does also have higher levels of those amino acids as well. Selenium is also incredibly important for this, for helping us make glutathione. Selenium is also another really important um, antioxidant for the thyroid. It's thought that maybe one of the reasons why selenium is so helpful for lowering thyroid antibodies is actually because of the role it has at glutathione production. And selenium is primarily found in Brazil nuts. So personally, I try to eat about five per day. Technically, about two or three is enough to meet your dietary requirements, but there's quite a bit of variation in food sources of selenium, so I always go a little bit higher than that. You can also supplement with selenium if you need to. Um, only risk of going too much is that you it can cause high blood sugar issues, so you always want to monitor anytime you're on a supplement. You can check your selenium levels um, just to make sure that you're not going overboard with how much selenium you're taking. Alpha lipoic acid is also really important for helping us make glutathione. There's foods that are rich in alpha lipoic acid. Again, those include organ meats, beef in general, brewer's yeast, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Um, broccoli and Brussels sprouts also are a sulfur rich food. Anything that's also in that cruciferous family, similarly to the allium family, also is really high in sulfur. Now, some people are sulfur sensitive, especially those that have SIBO, which we're going to talk about in a second when we talk about who glutathione might not be good for. So if you don't do well with sulfur rich foods, then maybe you can look at focusing on some of those other ways to get glutathione production up um, or potentially looking at a supplemental way to be able to help support that. And then, of course, treat the SIBO, because if you treat that, and that should help with um, taking care of the sulfur issues. Um, okay, so how do we supplement to get glutathione levels up? Well, you can supplement with glutathione. The thing to know is that it's not well absorbed. It doesn't get into the cell very easily. That's one of the reasons why we always recommend supplementing it liposomally, um, which essentially means that it gets absorbed through the mucosa of the mouth. So it's a liquid that you put on your in your mouth, um, and that is how it gets into the cell. Um, some people this works well for other people. We still don't see great absorption. Another option we can use is something called N-acetylcysteine or often referred to as NAC or NAC. Um, NAC is essentially the precursor to glutathione. So it's probably one of the more accessible ways that we can get um, intracellular levels of glutathione up. And it's generally supplemented through capsules. So sometimes it works better for people because you can travel with it or you can put it in your vitamin organizer. It's a little bit easier to take. Um, and it, it can also help with getting glutathione levels up. 
Um, I personally prefer to use glutathione if we if it works well for someone, um, but NAC is a really good backup option. So uh, it really just depends on the person's situation. This is where labs again become very helpful because then we can test glutathione levels. You know, we can test for oxidative stress to see, okay, is what were you doing moving the needle? And if not, do we go a different route to see these levels come up higher? Um, L-glutamine is another amino acid that helps us generate glutathione. Glutamine is also found in bone broth and bone in meats. Um, glutamine is also something really important for the gut, um, really important for our intestinal lining, helping with preventing what's called like intestinal permeability or leaky gut. And it can be something that's also supplemented to be able to help with the gut. Um, we are gonna have something coming for you guys very soon in this category that's going to contain glutamine for these many reasons, um, because one, it helps with production of glutathione, but two, it also helps with fixing the leaky gut situation, um, which we know that leaky gut is implicated in a lot of different health conditions, especially Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism, and PCOS. Um, I mentioned alpha lipoic acid food sources being another option. You can also supplement with alpha lipoic acid. That's another way to get your glutathione levels up. You can also increase your supplemental or food vitamin C intake. Um, just keep in mind the vitamin C has a very short half-life, which means that if you supplement it, it's better to take a smaller dose frequently throughout the day. A lot of people try to do like this mega dose of vitamin C. I once did it as a practitioner because that's what I was also taught to do until I learned that it actually you only absorb about 250 milligrams every couple of hours. Um, so it's best to actually spread that out over the day and do a smaller dose more often. I mentioned earlier that eating selenium rich foods is also important and you can also supplement that. It's actually the cofactor for the enzyme glutathione peroxidase. And this is the enzyme that's, that's responsible for converting reduced glutathione to oxidized glutathione. And that's the glutathione that helps protect our cells. So as I mentioned in the case of why is selenium so helpful for the thyroid, it's thought that it's because of the role that selenium has in this glutathione um, conversion process. Making sure we're getting enough B vitamins is also essential, especially things like folate, B6, and B12. They also help the body produce glutathione, uh, mainly through a process called methylation. Um, and we can get those, again, through eating enough proteins and leafy greens and things. Um, but we can also supplement them, especially if you ever have like high homocysteine levels or if you've gotten any blood work done that has revealed low levels of these labs, it could be something valuable. I like to see B12 levels over 600. The lab usually doesn't flag as uh, low until you're under 250. So if you've ever had B12 levels checked and you're in that middle, like layman or in that middle zone there, then I would definitely look at potentially supplementing and of course talk with your healthcare provider before you do so. Um, but over 600 tends to be kind of an optimal place for most women. Milk thistle can also be a great option. Um, cordyceps, another herbal um, type option. Cordyceps are a mushroom. Milk thistle is an herb. Uh, but milk thistle has also been shown to significantly increase glutathione levels um, and also working very similar to, to selenium and how it does so. Cordyceps are a functional adaptogenic mushroom, um, and they also have been shown to help support the production of glutathione by activating the glutathione enzyme cycle. And so those can also be something that you can look at supplementing with. Maybe if some of the other options don't work well for you, maybe you don't do well with things like NAC or um, glutathione because you have a sulfur sensitivity, then I'd really look at maybe addressing things from one of these other angles. Um, and not all of these things are necessary. Most people, like if you have adequate levels of B vitamins, you don't need B vitamin supplementation. If you're eating enough selenium, you might not need selenium supplementation. If you don't have a leaky gut, you probably don't need glutamine. You can get it through your food sources. Um, you know, if you uh, are have really good phase one liver activity, you might not need milk thistle. So there can be a lot of like ways to kind of deduce, okay, do we really need all of these things to support glutathione? No, we generally just need one, maybe two or three, depending on your unique situation. And sometimes we don't even need those forever. Um, and that's where sometimes doing testing can help us just to be able to kind of streamline things a little bit faster. But I would always say across the board is how can we try to get these food sources in as much as possible? possible um, because it's easy to do. A lot of them are like good nutritious foods in other areas too. Um, and it's going to take care of a lot of the baseline for a lot of these nutrients. And then you guys have probably heard me talk about before my love for liposomal glutathione, but that's another option that can be used for localized areas of inflammation. So I really love it for 
individuals with thyroid disease using it on the thyroid gland um, because we know that there's localized inflammation for those that have thyroid disease there. Um, If you have an area of inflammation, like maybe you have um, lupus and you have um, really bad joint pain in a certain area, then you could use it there. Um, You know, chronic fatigue, maybe you could use it like on the back of your neck. So you can kind of use it in different areas based off of where you think the need for it is. Um, If you're just like, I just want the generalized support of it, then it's going to be best absorbed at the back of your knees or the inside of your arms. So you can use it in those areas for just like full body support, um, or you can use it on a localized area for that localized inflammation. And I have a link to the brand that I recommend saved over on my Instagram. Um, And I think we can also probably include the link to that in the show notes below in case it's something you want to check out. Okay. What are the side effects, if any, that you should know about for glutathione? Well, there's a lot of different ways that we can support glutathione, like I mentioned. So it really will depend on what route you choose to go with. If we're just talking about glutathione, which we will today, since that's the purpose of the episode, then we're just going to focus on the side effects for if you chose to supplement with liposomal glutathione. Okay. Um, there's really not been many reported. The main one is bloating. And generally the bloating happens in people that have SIBO and that's because of the sulfur sensitivity. So if you have SIBO, especially if you know that it's sulfur SIBO or you have sulfur sensitivity, then I'd probably go with one of those other options, like I mentioned, for supporting your glutathione levels. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of other side effects of glutathione, um, but we do know that long-term supplementation of n acetylcysteine or glutathione can deplete certain minerals, especially minerals like zinc and copper. And this is due to its role in promoting a protein that's called metallothionine that's involved in how our body regulates like certain metals in the body. Um, so just keep an eye on things like that. And uh, you could always supplement with zinc, copper isn't really something that we supplement with, but you are eating lots of those good foods like liver, organ meats, and seeds and things that provide a lot of the other minerals, then you should be getting in a good amount of zinc and copper. Um, But those are always something that you could look at as um, supplementing with zinc in particular, and then um, just making sure you're getting adequate copper intake. Okay, that is everything for today. I really hope this episode shed some light on the role of glutathione and antioxidants and different thyroid and autoimmune related things. Um, Would love to hear any questions you guys have about this subject. You can always come message me over on Instagram at functional.feeling. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. We'll be back next week with another guest interview and I will talk to you guys then.